Here is Mark Pavola in the red t-shirt right here, and me sitting right next to him. We are in Florida there, and we, we did a lot of family trips together, lots, and did a lot of church stuff together. And so I know Mark, and Mark's a good man. And in my experience, Christians are good people. Uh, let me see if this thing works. Got to turn it on first. There we go. Yep, 84,000 Christian charities in the U.S. So I'm not going to bash Christians today. I'm just going to tell my story. So uh, here I am, junior high school. I went to Washington Junior, which is right over here by Old Central. At that time, I felt like I really had a personal relationship with God. I, uh, I remember laying in my bed at night and praying and singing, crying, thanking God for saving me. Also at this age, I remember witnessing coming downtown here after school and talking to people about Jesus, which was a little scary, but I didn't want people to go to hell, so I, I did it. Uh, got a little older, went on mission trips. I was a bass player in a Christian band. Camp counselor, I did a Christian rock radio program every weekday for an hour. When I was 18, I attended UMD. It was my first year, and I took a philosophy class from Professor Cole, who spoke here in November. And as part of that class, he presented the classic arguments for and against the existence of God. And that was the first time that my faith was uh, really challenged. So I remember he put this up on the board. God is all powerful and all good. If you believe that, you go to step two. If God is all powerful, he can end evil. Sure, he can. If God is good, he would end evil. Why not? Yet evil exists. I believe that as a Christian, for sure. Therefore, God must not exist. So this was a confusing, difficult problem for me. I scoured the bookstores and I read everything I could find. I read The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis, I remember. It wasn't just philosophy for me, it was real. So here's a young girl getting raped. And after she's raped, she'll be killed to, to hide the evidence. Something like this is going on right now somewhere. And God is standing right there by this young girl. And he could give that man a, you know, cause him to faint or something and save her. But he doesn't. Now, what if it was me standing there by this girl? Okay. Let's say I had a gun on me. And let's say this is somebody you know, your daughter, your, your sister, your girlfriend, wife. You would hope that I try to do something to save her. If I'm a good person, I would. If I'm, even if I'm just an average person, I would try to do something to help her. Who would you rather have standing there by your daughter? Me with a gun or God? What's God going to do? I'm going to pull that gun out and say, back off, you know, but what's God going to do? He's going to do the same thing he always does. Same thing he's doing right now somewhere. Nothing. So why does God do nothing? Well, what I was told growing up is that there was this talking snake who was actually the devil who gave fruit to Adam and Eve and they ate it, disobeying God, and it made God really, really mad. So angry that he punished all of humanity so that everyone suffers and some people really suffer. People starve to death, and children get cancer, and people get raped. You know. And then everyone dies. And then everyone goes to hell, except for a small number of people who deserve hell. But God saves a small number. Gets lonely in heaven, I guess. So what we can say to her 
is, well, well, God said to Adam and Eve, don't eat the fruit. But they did anyway, so, so uh, you deserve it. You, you had it coming because you were born in sin. So this was a problem for me. But my faith was strong, and I pressed on. I became a teacher at Lakeview Christian Academy, a board member of a large church, a Sunday school director, a youth leader. Uh, I taught Bible studies to, to uh, you know, college kids and high school kids and teenagers and these kids here, including Ryan's sister there in the pink sweatshirt. Um, but as I was studying the Bible, teaching the Bible, I kept finding a lot of contradictions. I, the Lord, do not change. Then the Lord changed his mind. And it wasn't just detail stuff. It was the important things. Like in Mark, Jesus is crucified at 9 in the morning, the day after Passover. And in John, Jesus is condemned at noon and then handed over and crucified that day, the day before Passover. John was written later, and they thought of, well, let's have Jesus die at, this, at the same time the Passover lambs are, are sacrificed. The longest contradiction in the Bible is the Christmas stories. The one on the left here is the story from Luke. Joseph and Mary live in uh, Nazareth, and they travel up to Bethlehem for the census, and uh, that's the story with Jesus is born in a manger, and there's shepherds and angels. And none of that stuff is in the Matthew story. In the Matthew story here, uh, Joseph and Mary live in Bethlehem in a house, and uh, the wise men go to visit baby Jesus. They follow a star to get there, to find Jesus. Try following a star sometime. Um, so that's the story with Herod killing all the babies, and Joseph and Mary flee to Egypt where they stay for a long time. None of that stuff is in the Luke story. And even the lineage of Jesus is different. These stories were added later to show that, to find a story that Jesus came from Bethlehem, the city of David, because of a prophecy. The most important story to Christians, I would guess, is the resurrection story. Again, just read the different accounts and compare them. Who went to the tomb? Was it Mary or were there others? What did they find there? Was there was the stone rolled away or not? And was there a man there or an angel or two men? And what did they say? And where did the women go afterward? What town did they go to? What did they, were they silent about it afterward or not? It's all different. So this was a big problem for me because my faith was based on the Bible. If I, if I couldn't trust the Bible, how would I know what parts to believe and what not to believe? The Bible says that all scripture is God breathed. And in fact, I happen to notice on the Bayside Baptist Church Mark Palfazier website, it says that you believe the Bible is the word of God, and it cites this very verse, that all scripture is God-breathed. Well, on this napkin, it says the napkin religion is the one true religion because it says so right here on this napkin. <laughs> so it's not really evidence. So science was causing me to question my faith as well. So here's a bird that according to scientists, used to be able to fly, but like many birds, it ended up in a place where there weren't really predators, and it, it, it found, didn't need to maintain a physical structure that could fly. It found a different way to survive. But according to creationists, God made a bird with wings that don't work. Now, of course, you can find some other use uses for the wings, I suppose, but but the problem is, this kind of thing is everywhere. It's like in every animal and even in plants. There's just genes that don't show up, you know. Um, it's everywhere. You can't explain it all away. Like, let me just give one example, because this is short. So here's humans and snow monkeys. That snow monkey in the back there climbed up out of the water, shook itself off shivered, and its goosebumps caused its hair to fluff out. 
and this enables the monkey to create a warm layer of air over its body. Humans also have goosebumps that activate when we're cold, but they do nothing to warm us up. They're just left over from the distant past when our bodies were covered with hair. So why would an intelligent designer with intellect and foresight give us this feature, goosebumps, that doesn't do anything? It's evidence of no design, and it's everywhere. So a lot of questions in my head, if there's a God, you know, did he create us? Doesn't seem to be like he did. And did he, you know, did he communicate with us in any coherent way? Did he, does he care about human suffering? All these questions. Finally, I was in my late 20s and I, I uh, lost my faith. And this is what happened, you know, in putting on lipstick. <laughs> I uh, look like I'm just getting smashed there. Actually, I'm drinking, uh, I'm in Japan and I'm drinking Kalpis, which is like a yogurt drink. But they couldn't say L, so they called it Kalpis, which was funny. But while I was in Japan, my, uh, my missionary cousin gave me, uh, loaned me this CD, Christian CD that I used to love, and I just kind of fell right back into my Christian faith for a while. Relapse rates are 60%. So here I am wearing Jesus t-shirts and I wrote a lot of Christian music. I made a CD. I'm playing at Chester there and uh, I was leading a big Bible study and just 100% back in. But then I had babies and that changed everything. So when I, f I really think this changed things for me because when I had babies, I, I was kind of separated from the Christian world. I couldn't go to church and all the time in Bible study and go play music. You know, I was, I just came home from work and then my then wife went to work and I was just doing diapers and laundry and feeding and stuff like this. I didn't even have time for, uh, to read books. But I could listen, I could listen to audio books. And uh, uh, I did a lot of that in my 30s. I listened to a lot of history and science. And I, uh, by the time I was 40, I was no longer a Christian. I just slowly changed. I think step by step over a period of several years there. But I was in the closet about it because I was still married to a Christian at that time and I was working at my cousin's school in Japan which is a Christian school and my plan was just to raise my boys as Christians. But they had a lot of questions like who's Buddha? Well you know how in Japan they eat, I said well in Japan they eat sushi instead of hamburgers and they have Buddha instead of Jesus, you know? It's just, it's just, and so I just threw it in with the comparison, they were fine with that, so that worked. But one time we were in this park, and we saw a Japanese hornet, I don't know if you know what those are, but they're like two inches long, and if they sting you, you go to the hospital probably, it's really bad, so. We ran, and when we got home, my son drew this picture, and I found it, and, uh, but then he asked me, he said, Dad, why did God make hornets? And I thought, oh, that does seem kind of mean. I thought, you know, should I tell him now about the talking snake? And I couldn't look at my boys and tell them that this happened. And so I said, I don't know, I don't know. So Japan still, and uh, one time we were walking up to the school and it was winter and cold and windy. And, and suddenly the wind just kicked in and my son uh, just walked up to me right away just automatically and I remember I picked him up and, and he put his face in my jacket kind of this is a precious memory <laughs> sorry I'm just starting to get a little emotional here but uh, I remember he said dad uh, why is God mad at us because the wind was so strong you know and uh well, God made the wind. He can stop the wind. Uh, it's a legitimate question, I think. You know, uh, did we do something to make God angry? What's going on here, Dad? He was confused because I gave him bad information. 
And I remember having similar questions growing up, you know? And it was kind of a turning point for me. I remember, you know, I thought, what am I going to do then? What am I going to do next? Am I going to uh, bring him to church where he hears about this all the time, you know? Human sacrifice, and it's a good thing. I think this is from the Passion, and we just talked about this. I know you guys showed the Passion the day before Easter, and uh, a lot of churches do, but oh my God, I mean, it's like two hours of just beating a person to bloody, you know? But anyway, then there's this part. Son, you're so awful, you made God kill his son. He sent his son to die like this because of your sin. It should be you up there on that cross. Remember hearing that kind of thing? Uh, but don't worry. All you have to do is believe in Jesus or you'll burn in hell forever just like all your Japanese friends because they're Buddhists. <laughs> um, yeah, fear isn't a good reason to believe things. So my boys are 15. They're going to have to buy a car. Do I want them to to pray that God sends them to the right car dealer? Or do I want them to do the research? They may want to uh, figure out how to prevent getting the flu someday. Do I want them to look in the Bible for tips for preventing the flu? No. <laughs> because it doesn't mention germs in the Bible. And it would have been really nice if God would have just put one paragraph in the Bible about germs. I mean, just the plague, you know? Um, but he didn't. So many people I know use their religion to help them decide who to marry, whether to marry, where to live, their career choice, friends to have, what to eat, what to wear, how to have sex. Their religion influences all this stuff. And I didn't want this for my boys, and I didn't want this for anybody. And so I came out as godless atheist threatening Christian civilization. And I've been co-facilitating at Freethinkers for a few years now. We meet the first Sunday of every month at the Duluth Radisson. Yeah. Find us online. Uh, yeah, but we know that Christians are good people. And here's Ryan, the person I normally co-host this with. And Ryan is a good guy. He's a Christian. And he had clothing drives and things at his church. And he does this TED Talks thing for free, you know. And there he is in Africa helping people. He's not here, though, you know. So I'm going to point out a little irony here. That little girl in the pink dress is uh, carrying an even bigger bucket of water. <laughs> I hope you watch this, Ryan. Um, yeah, no, but Ryan is, you know, Christians are good people. I just want to make that clear. And then again, this is an orphanage, and they're feeding these kids and who lost their parents to AIDS, like 20 million Africans have died of AIDS. And they're clothing them and feeding them, and Christians are doing lots of good work around the world, but there's irony in this picture, too. And that is, if the Catholics were passing out condoms instead of condemning them, many of these kids would still have their parents, I would guess. Love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight, delight in evil but rejoices in the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. This is great. I tried to live by this as a Christian, and I still do. And I think it would be great if atheists memorized this too. There are a lot of great things in our Christian heritage that I don't ever want to lose. And so I'm just going to leave it right there. Thank you. Dave and I have been friends. We have, our families have known each other since we were very, very young. Dave